I, I actually did background a couple times before I got speaking parts in TV and film. And I do recall vividly just going, wow, I'm on a movie set. I'm on a, I'm on a music video set there. We're not paying for our meals and they're no. paying us 50 bucks or 150 bucks to just sit or stand. Like I thought, I thought I had made it back then. You know what I mean? No, man. I know. Like I work, I work, you know. I work, work as an extra too. When I was going to school up in Oregon. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was a show called The Way West, and it was about the Oregon Trail. And I was like, what? Oh, that's full circle, dude. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So wow. Funny. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the SAG After Foundation's Conversations at Home program. I'm Scott Nance. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to moderate today's conversation with two of the nominees for Outstanding Performance by a Male Actor in a Television Movie or Limited Series. Please welcome playing Shea Brennan on 1883, Sam Elliott. Welcome, Sam. Good morning, Scott. Thank you. Good morning. And playing Larry Hall on Blackbird, Paul Walter Hauser. How are you, Paul? Good, Scott. Big fan of you. You know that. Thanks for having me. Well, right back at both of you. So, so listen, I, I got to start with Sam because you know your 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 career has has in some ways been synonymous with the the genre of the western. But I still felt like 1883 was very very different from just the traditional western and, and anything you've ever done. Uh, what were the first conversations that you had uh, with Taylor, uh, Taylor Sheridan, about 1883? Oh my God. When this script came to me, I was actually laying in bed and recuperating from some surgery I just had. And I told Taylor I didn't really know that I was up for it on a physical level. And he wasn't having any of that. And he said, I'm not going to do it without you. And, uh, you know, we just, we just went on from there. You know, it's Taylor, Taylor's work is, you know, I mean, it's everybody talks about Taylor Sheridan in terms of what he creates and, Shea Brennan was one of those characters that he knows about. He knows the genre. He knows those characters. And, you know, yeah, it was, it was on some levels, not a big stretch for me, but it was on other levels, it was a, a, an opportunity to go inside rather than so much of the outside is what you see. So that's typical. a really, really great way to put it, uh, Sam. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Paul, I want to ask, you know, you know, in, in, in just these last few years, you know, your work has been, uh, you're really been like a chameleon in, in, in movies like I, Tanya and Late Night, you know, a comedy like that. And now with Blackbird, uh, you know, really, really diving deep into a character who has a, let's say he's complex to say the least. Uh, what were your first conversations with Dennis Lehane uh, about Blackbird? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I I kind of have like the bucket list in my head of like what I would like to <clears throat> get to do in this profession before I'm done with it or before it's done with me more likely. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it's got everything from Western to horror films to a rom-com, whatever. But one of the things I really wanted to play was some icky, icky gooey bad guy, you know, uh, like a serial killer or something uh or a mob boss or something like that so the fact that this came across my proverbial desk and was like uh a chance to play somebody really odious and dark and sinister like that and then it's dennis lahane's writing like i i was i was very much on board just trying to get him on board with me i did a interview uh audition over zoom and uh and I guess he saw enough to trust me and trust that role to me. But um, but part of it, I got to be honest, so some people try to give me too much credit uh, sort of unlawfully that I'm, I get all these great roles. A lot of a lot of times it's like uh, I just look like the son of a bitch. I just look, I just look enough like the guy, you know what I mean? And uh, and so in the case of I, Tanya, Richard Jewell, uh, Blackbird, um, I, I think the familiarity 
visually has been a great aid to me. And we don't have a lot of guys that that look like me. We have a few, but not not a not a ton. I think back on guys I love, like Ned Beatty, um, is an example of of a guy who used to do the type of stuff I do now. You know. Wow, Paul. That's a great comparison. That is a really great comparison. You know, Sam, you brought up something that really was a, an aspect to Shay that I I really was drawn into from the very first episode of 1883, and that was the inward performance. You know, more, but I'm, it's definitely a physical role, I and mean, we'll get into that. But uh, you really, he really is very much inward. So, what were your I guess your points of connection for Shay, like, like what was your approach to him? You know, uh, uh, Scott, uh, in terms of an approach and in terms of, you know, what's in your head as an actor, I, I'm, I'm more from the school. Just say the fucking words. <laughs> just, just get in there and commit to it. You know, if the words are right and you have the ability to commit to the words, and to commit to the people around you. And you're fortunate enough to be blessed with an incredible cast to work with. You know, it's uh, it's not that difficult. When, it, when, when it's Taylor Sheridan words, again, you know, Taylor understood this character and it rang true to me. You know, the, the whole, you know, the guy's wounded on, a, on some deep level. You know, he, he was, he's a vet from the Civil War, so he's got that going on. He burns the house with his wife and daughter in it in the beginning, of, you know, the first episode. So he's, he's carrying a, quite a load throughout this journey. And at the same time, he's trying to fulfill, fulfill this commitment to this, you know, band of Europeans that he's taken north. Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, Paul in terms of your approach you know your points of connection i mean you know for for crying out loud larry is uh there's there's something about him throughout the course of these six episodes of blackbird that you, you really do feel like an, an empathy for him i mean if that's the right word uh, you know so what was your approach to to larry and what were some of the conversations uh, that you had with dennis to like that really helped you get all right i know I, and also the research that you did because i mean there's footage of this person yeah, there there actually wasn't any footage of him. Not that I was privy to or, or made aware of. I, 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 it goes back to what Sam said about sort of being set up for success when you have, uh, when you have some good courier twelve font and you have a good cast and people are acting like professionals. It is quite easy to do that. Uh, approaching the character was <clears throat> kind of difficult just because I. It, you have to go all the way with something like that. Not to say that you don't go all the way with other stuff, but it's just a different degree of different degree of uh, specificity is what I would call it. Because you can do something simple and it can be really hard too. But this, if this thing wasn't super specific, uh, it was going to feel kind of mustache twirly, uh, you know, tying the girl to the railroad tracks. So I, I thought, you know, the the smartest thing I could do is go deep. There wasn't really any footage of the guy, a lot of photos and some case files, you know, but uh, I guess I'm just weird enough to uh, make my own assessments like we all have to. And, and, and with Dennis's writing, it makes that journey a lot more possible. And, uh, and you, and you gotta be able to fall back and have fun too. Cause there's some stuff I don't even remember doing that, you know, you rewatch it or somebody pulls you aside and tells you and you go, oh, good. Glad that worked, you know, because <laughs> in the moment you're kind of guessing in the dark. It's no it's I always talk about acting like like it's it's my athletics. It's it's my sport. And when you're on the court or on the field, uh, a lot of it does become instinctual. And you, it's not like you're always playing by the playbook. Sure. Absolutely. You know, if it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage. And, you know, Sam, you, you talk about the great words written by, by Taylor. Uh, but what were, you know, especially compared to some of the, some of the Westerns you've done in the past, 
what were some of the unique challenges that you that you faced with 1883 not just physical but emotional challenges well i I somehow think that most of the challenges were physical for me you know i mean again it's when you when you have the words on the page as you just said and you've got this cast that you're working with i mean my sidekick la monica you know that relationship was something that was born right away you know the first time we encountered each other and uh there were just encounters throughout you know i mean it, it's it's such a a gift to be gone and and you know you we we go away we leave our home we leave our loved ones we go away and we go to some distant location and this particular show it was like 5 6 months away from home and uh it's like a you you become like a band of gypsies and you fall in love with people on the cast with people on the crew with you know and, and it just becomes another world on some on some level scott it's uh I mean, you know, you're there to focus on something, and it, at the same time, you're immersed in this giant thing that you just you suffer it together. And and because it was during the pandemic, I mean, we were all getting tested every morning. We got people dropping out right and left. I mean, we lost nearly a hundred people on the entire thing throughout, and uh, it had a, it had its own set of challenges. But in terms of what I get into in my head again, I just I just try to be true to what's on the page. Mm-hmm. Tell me, you know, and you know, I, with- I, I, I want to hold on that, Sam, uh, uh, and stay with you on you. You brought up Lamonica in particular, who, of course, you know, you you have the most volley with. I would say. Uh, you know, when you're when you're looking at a role, you're talking to Taylor and, you know, you're thinking about your approach and whatever, or maybe not thinking, not overthinking it at this point in your career. But then you meet your cast. And this is actually a question for both of you, but I want to stay on Sam with this. Like when you met, you know, when you started doing your rehearsals with with Tim McGraw and La Monica, like how did the volley, how did being with your fellow actors, fellow, fellow cast members, like take your performance, like to another level, like help you navigate and, you know, be like, okay, I, I got this. <laughs> I don't know that there's answers to these questions here <laughs> on some level, you know, beyond my stumbling and mumbling that I'm giving you. It's, we all knew that we were there doing something special. And you know when you hit it or when you don't, or when you you need to go further, you know, and you've, you've got a great director working with you as well. You know, we had Ben and Christina were our two directors on the show as well as Taylor. And, you know, it's, you're being looked after, but you, you just, it's a feeling. It just, you know, when it, when it rings, it rings. When it sings, it sings, you know, and, uh, I don't know. When it doesn't, you know that too, you know, and you're, sure. and you're hopefully you can get another take and get a better shot at it. I, but, you know. I love that. When it rings, it rings. When it sings, it sings. It's like, it is, it, it is like something goes off or doesn't go off. It's like a firework. It's either a firework or it's a dud and, and you, you got sold a, a lemon, you know? I'll tell you one of the amazing things about Taylor is he, he, he cast people that, you know, he's got some old dog in there, yeah. But he's got other people that have never worked before. You know, Graziella Brancusi, who played the girlfriend, her little Monica, you know, Noemi. She'd never worked before. She'd never done a film before. She, she's done stage work and that kind of stuff. But, she's you know, she's a young lady who's never worked on film before. And now she's doing Mayor of Kingstown. And wow. that's another great thing about Taylor Sheridan is he hires people that he's worked with. He brings them in on other jobs as well. Amazing. Amazing. That level. Incredible. Well, Paul, when it rings, it rings. And when it sings, it sings. You got a lot of ringing, a lot of singing going on with Taryn uh, the, the 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 chemistry that you two have in terms of just bringing out just these great performances out of each other. Uh, describe that process, your collaboration with Taryn. Yeah, I I really 
Man, I, I really, uh, I, I saw the first time I saw him was in. I guess I heard his voice and sing. I took my nieces and nephews to see that a number of years ago, and then, and then I saw him in Rocket Man in theaters that summer. It came out, and I, I thought I was like, this guy is, this guy did it. He pulled it off, and by pulled it off, I don't just mean the acting thing. I mean like there's a lot of pressure to play a real person in general, but especially this musical iconic person that's become, you know, as big as like a Coca-Cola or a Chevrolet. Uh, that's, that's a lot of pressure uh, on anybody, but a young man um, like Taron, he was, I think he shot that in his mid to late twenties. I was like, dude, this guy is one to watch. Um and then uh, when, when the offer came in, or the audition, then the offer, it was just on the back of Taryn and Dennis. Those are the two elements that were in place. And, uh, you know, it, the, the whole true crime thing is a pretty oversaturated subgenre at the Completely. moment. There's about Completely. 90 serial killer shows right now. Um, and I don't know what that says about culture, but what I did, what I did like about our show is that the the approach was pretty uh play, it played like a, i told people it plays like a psychological character driven crime thriller uh you know it's it, it at its core it's drama it could easily be a play you know absolutely uh, absolutely no up on the stage you know you're not mopping up blood every every night on stage with this show and i thought that was really enticing and then when i got there and worked with taryn you know He's super prepared. He's thoughtful. There's there aren't there's no ego, but there are expectations. And people who aren't familiar with what we do for a living probably look at that as ego. But we both had these expectations of we gotta we gotta make sure we get this right. And and we working with him was great because not only is he a great actor, but him having the confidence to have those reasonable expectations and making sure we get every little thing right. Uh, that was, I, I learned a lot from him. And I don't love saying that about someone younger than me, but I, I loved getting to learn so much from Taryn. I don't, I, I don't think he learned much from me. He was probably just very amused by me, but, uh, <laughs> but I learned a lot from him, man. He, he made that thing sing and ring for sure. Oh, wonderful. That's great. Uh, you know, and Sam, you know, you brought up how yeah, you were. Oh, I cannot learn from you. I doubt that very seriously. What did you say? I said I doubt that. I doubt what you said about him not learning from you. Oh, thanks, man. Anybody would learn from you, pal. Hmm. Sorry, Scott. Yeah, that's, all, that's okay. No, no, that's a really, really great point. Um, you know, Sam. You were talking a little about about how you were filming 1883 uh and and so many people were affected by by covid and it just like made things difficult filming and that's right you know you were filming 1883 during the period of time during the pandemic and it was still very very uh very serious for lack of a better word so my question sam is like all the prep and all the rehearsal you got to do and you know filming on location and you know whether it's the extreme heat or the freezing cold you know then you've got this this pandemic that that's that's affecting the production like how how did you sort of uh you and the cast and the crew sort of take strength from how difficult the shoot was to really just give it your best and knock it out of the park you know make the best of the situation I think it was a matter of survival for all of us on some level. You know, when we when we started, it was August in Fort Worth. Temperatures got up above the hundreds for a lot. We're all wearing wool clothes, oh. and you know, it's that coupled with the action that we're doing. It was tough. It was tough. I lost a lot of weight that summer. And we ended up in Montana for a month and it was, you know, it was down in the teens up there. But again, it's just, everyone was so together and so committed. That's that word I keep getting back to. Whether they were on the company, whether they're in the production office, whether they're on the cast or on the crew, everybody was on this mission. 
and we knew that we had something special. You know, I mean, it's not like, you know, gee, I hope this works out. You know, sure. we were doing something that hadn't been done for a long time, a good period Western. Not that there hasn't been a few of them, but not one on this scale. There's never been anything on this scale for television that I'm aware of. You know, I mean, telling a tale about the Oregon Trail, you know, and uh, there's a lot of hard work involved. But, you know, I, I think everybody was up to it. Yeah, you there's look. Also, there's a lot of moving pieces in a show like that. My show, it was like we had our hurdles, but we're at the end of the day, it's a, it's a couple people talking in a room. Uh, and, and having extras and making sure everything is time period appropriate and horses and I mean that 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 can also be a deterrent and a distraction when you're trying to act because there's yes, just so much shit going on you know. But there was so much so much of it that was right you know I mean there was there's always things that you fall short on in terms of the reality of the time or the period but there was so much of it that was right. And you mentioned the, the the numbers of people we had. You know, there was a couple of hundred people on the wagon train, and a lot of these extras that were working. You know, they didn't have anything to do other than make the journey, and it was it was tough on them. And nobody ever complained about it. One guy dropped out the first second day. I guess it was we were shooting an interior. We started inside in Fort Worth and. It was a really hot gymnasium. This guy, we, I, was, I, was, I was in the middle of a monologue, and I heard this big clunk in the back of the room. And I thought, what the fuck was that? And got through the and heard all these people start commotion going on. And some guy dropped out, and he spent two nights in the hospital. You know, it was so. Uh, people never complained about it. They were just happy to be there. You know, and. Some of them had their moment. They got a word here and there, and it was we were all so excited for them when their moment came. You know, it was it I, was a, uh, real special. I, I actually did background a couple times before I got speaking parts in TV and film, and I do recall vividly just going, "Wow, I'm on a movie set. I'm on a I'm on a music video set. There, we're not paying for our meals." And they're yep. paying us fifty bucks or one hundred fifty bucks to just sit or stand. Like I thought, I thought I had made it back then. You know what I mean? No, man. I like know. I worked. I worked you know? work, work as an extra too when I was going to school up in Oregon. Oh, really? yeah. yeah, it was. It was a show called The Way West, and it was about the Oregon Trail. And I was like, "What? Oh, that's full circle, dude!" I'm there. Right? I'm there. Yeah. So wow. Funny. That is amazing. Uh, you know, Paul, it when you when you have to live with a character for so long, like let's say Richard Jewell and now and now Larry, what what's that like to get into character, stay into character, and go that that deep and stay in that world for so long? Mm, um, I think I think sometimes it it can be uh, what's the word I'm looking for. I think sometimes it can actually be a good thing because you um, once you kind of settle into a character, then you're just kind of discovering things and you're and you're you're kind of pouring concrete on a few things and you feel like you get a, I guess you get a handle of the character, which is nice about television, you know, um, in my opinion. Uh, but but what's difficult is. Um, just getting sick of it. You know, I did stand up comedy for over a decade uh, in Los Angeles and Chicago. And one takeaway of why I never made it as a stand up comic, other than just being average, was I I got sick of my own jokes. I got sick of my own content. And I didn't have enough life experience to just write a new hour of comedy or something. I had about 40 minutes, 45 at the most, uh, that I would kind of recycle and repeat. Um, so just similar, I, I say that to say the characters, sometimes you just want to get the hell out of the skin. Richard Jewell was only like seven weeks. And mm -hmm. at least I felt like he was a decent enough guy, albeit flawed. Um, whereas, uh, Larry, they told me four months and it turned into five and a half. And I was, 
I mean, I had, I started going to meetings. I, I got sober in the middle of the shoot, if that tells you anything. Uh, so I'm forever grateful for that experience. It helped me out. Uh, it revealed some things about myself, uh, maybe that I didn't want to. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, it's playing a character like that can be good creatively and it can be awful personally. Um, I just did this show called the after party. It's a comedy at Apple with, uh, a bunch of funny folks, Ken Jong and Tiffany Haddish and all these people, Elizabeth Perkins. Um, Season one is awesome. <laughs> yeah. But, but, and, and, and I really liked the show, but I said it to say it was so nice to, do comedy for and you've done comedy i know you did the ranch sam i've seen you on that and i mean there is something nice to kind of let the air out and know that you're not having to uh you're walking into a scrimmage instead of a super bowl you know yeah you don't take a lot of that home at night that's a nice thing i can't imagine living with this character you played brother (laughs) (laughs) one and done (laughs) <laughs> one and done. One and done. <laughs> we'll be doing that again. Uh, people, I, I have people on the street occasionally. They'll say, "Hey, when is season two? And I'm like, "I, I, there won't be a season two. I'm not, I'm not, not putting that face on again. Not doing wow. it." <laughs> Sam, I want to ask, uh, you know, uh, Paul brought up a really good point about discovering things about your character along the journey. So, you know, when you when you started filming 1883 and throughout the duration of your shoot, you know, once you like got the character down, were there things about Shay that you discovered for your performance along the way? I think it was really what, what I discovered was the the degree that Shay was living what he was living or feeling what he was feeling or suffering what he was suffering from. And I go back to it again. I go back to, you know, I mean, I knew what was on the page. I knew what I was going to do. I go in prepared and, you know, and it's, I don't, I like to think that I go in there and it's, it's in my head, but it's not in cement. It, it's, it can be adjusted you know, depending upon what the director's asking me or what he's presenting to me. But when you're working with people like Miss May, how about Miss May? <laughs> I dearly love. Isabel just, you know, there was, there's a scene where the two of us, after she's lost her boyfriend, and uh, we're sitting on the ground, and I tell her that I've, you know, I heard this story from an Apache one time about what happens to your soul, you know. And uh, I was supposed to have been on horseback on that and kind of right up on her. She's out crying out away from the wagon train. And I got there that morning thinking I was going to be on horseback, wondering how that fuck am I going to like walk up on horseback and make this scene work? And I got there and Ben told me, you're going to walk up to her and sit. And I thought, oh, fuck, what a great thought that was, you know, that there's a, one of those great directorial things, no big deal. You're not on a horse, you're on foot, but it made all the difference in the world because it brought the two of us together to share ah. this grief that we had. And, uh, you know, I just I just can't say enough about everybody that's on this show. You know, I keep getting back to it, and I keep getting back to what a gift the whole thing has been. You know, I'm not sure that this isn't going to be my swan song in some way. You know, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty picky now at this point in what I do, and there's not a lot of stuff that's coming my way that I'm thinking, wow, i got to go to work. I mean, I, I'm not ready to retire, but if I oh, were, you know. We're not ready for you. Yeah, yeah. that's an adult. You know, Sam, I do have to tell you that, you know, knowing that you feel the way about 1883 and about your performance as Shay, while I was watching this the first time, because I, you know, I went back and I rewatched it to prep for for this conversation, which was a which was a, a pleasure to do because I just think it's such a such a great series. There's just such a depth to your performance, Sam, and I too, you know, have seen a great deal of your work over these years. Uh, 
you know, and to still seeing you at this stage pull something different like you did in A Star is Born and with 1883, uh, I feel like 1883 is just the best work I've seen you do, and that's a bold statement. I appreciate that, Scott. That's why I say I'm not sure it's not my swan song, maybe. <laughs> hey, well, we'll get back to that in a second. <laughs> Paul. <laughs> But if, if in fact it is, it, again, it's because of the material, because of all the people on both sides of the camera, and particularly the brothers and sisters that are members of this union, were for the reason that we're both sitting here, that all of us are sitting here. Paul, what you were going to say? I just, I was listening to Sam and I, uh, the Swan Song thing, and I was like, dude, uh, Clint Eastwood's like 93 or something and, and he yeah. always says every day he's like don't let the old man in don't <laughs> let the old man in and uh, it's worked for him yeah so, it work. has worked for him I'm not Clint Eastwood brother <laughs> <laughs> Paul the so many great moments of your performance in Blackbird but I think the tour of the force, the two hander, as they call it in the business, that 11 minute scene with you and Taryn is uh, just, and you know what I'm talking about. Everyone who has watched Blackbird knows what I'm talking about. Go ahead. I, mean, I actually don't know which scene you're talking about. Are you talking about episode five or six? The finale? Five. 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 Oh, the, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that's a good point. Six is good. But five that, you know, uh, like, what was it like to, because it's all like kind of one take and how many, how did you approach that? Like, like, did you and Taryn like do a couple of rehearsals and how many takes did you do? Take us through it. That day was kind of a blur because of the, um, content of the, the scene. And, uh, the, I remember the crew being really, um, considerate, uh, like our camera operator, Colin McDowell, McDonald, um, uh, every everybody was it was almost like a closed set type of feeling, even though they were there in mass. It wasn't a few people, it wasn't a skeleton crew, um, and I really appreciated that. Uh, that was helpful. Um, I just try to stay present. I think with a scene like that, where there's so many details, um, you don't want to you don't want to do the stand up comedy thing where you're just barking the material or the uh, medical procedural thing where you're like, let's get this out here. It was very much Larry, the character, Larry's telling a story to somebody else and I'm the storyteller behind the storyteller. So don't forget you're telling a story. And when I tell a story and I'm like, you wouldn't believe what happened at the DMV or uh, let me tell you about this sermon. I just heard it changed my whole perspective or whether I'm pitching a movie. I, I have certain unconscious theatrical sort of conventions there. So when I'm telling the story as Larry, I was just wanted to be sure to like peg in some things that felt like you would do. Like when I talk about, I'm trying to get, I, I can't think of the word tourniquet in the scene. And I'm like one of those. Uh, and then he says tourniquet. And I'm like, yeah. So like there's weird little hand motions, the same. And here's why I think it's disturbing and it might work is if I'm telling you a story about my sandwich, I'm like, oh, God, it was like a layer of mayo and cheese and then the meat. And then they put on and I'm using my hands, not even thinking. So there's a nonchalance and immediacy to that that is disturbing when applied elsewhere, like a murder scene. So I'm I'm doing stuff like this and I'm as if I'm telling any old story, but I'm telling a really effed up story. So uh, to me, it was just about getting a couple of those little nuancey things in to try to make it interesting and, and then try not to forget the dialogue because I'm not one of these highly, highly theater trained people. I've, I did plays in high school. I did one floor of the cuckoo's nest in the, the uh, Tokyo arts district in LA in front of 45 people. Like, I have some, but um, those words can still kick my ass on occasion. And uh, and it was tricky to to remember every adjective and every bit. Yeah. You, know, you know, Sam, I got to ask you, you're talking about like what you're looking for, you know, look like, like, how do you top this sort of thing? And I, I also uh, wanted to mention your film, The Hero, which I 
absolutely loved. Um, so, so the question is kind of like, you know, at this stage, what are you looking like? What floats your boat? What rocks your world when you read a script or, or read about a character that makes you good, that will make you go at this point. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I'm doing this. Yeah. I think it's just something that if, it, whether I think I can pull it off, you know, and I, I've got this Western thing down by now. And I, and I always feel like it's a treat to get something that gets me out of this box. I, I used to like kind of grouse about being the guy with the hat sitting on the horse and never being able to get by that. I remember I was in, uh, in Texas doing a thing called the Rough Riders with John Milius years ago. And I got a script from the Coen brothers delivered to me on, on set. And I, that was kind of when I was in that period of thinking, am I ever going to get away from this fucking Western thing? And, and I get this script from the Coen brothers. I got it out on the set and I'm so excited to get back to the hotel room and thinking I'm going to fucking, it's going to be a chance to play one of those wacky characters is going to get do something totally different than I've ever done. And I get back to the room and I start looking at it. And I read, there's a song tumbling tumbleweeds in the background. And then we see this character or hear this voice sounding, not unlike Sam Elliott. <laughs> and then pretty soon he shows up in the bowling alley as the stranger looking not unlike Sam Elliott and he's dressed like a drugstore cowboy. And I'm thinking, oh, what the fuck, man? So I kind of embraced it since then, the Western thing. And, you know, that's why I look at 1883 on some level and think it wasn't really a big stretch because it was territory that I was well familiar with. And, uh, I think again on, you know, it, that's what made it so special. I've done so many Westerns, but I've never done one like this. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Tombstone was special. A lot of people talk about Tombstone and there were, it certainly was special on many levels, but not the level that 1883 was across the board. This thing was special. Agreed. Agreed. And by the way, big shout out to The Big Lebowski, which mm -hmm. what a movie, like like what a life that movie has taken on with these yeah. Lebowski conventions. I mean, that's the five minutes so, man. The dude rules, you know, the, the dude, dude abides. <laughs> Paul, but take us out with like, like what floats your boat? What rocks your world when you read a script? a teleplay, have a conversation with a, uh, a, a, a show runner that makes you go, all right. Yeah, absolutely. I'm doing this. Um, before I answer that, I just want to say one of the greatest award season injustices, uh, is John Goodman not being nominated for best supporting actor for the big Lebowski. It's very hard for me sometimes to take award season seriously when that was overlooked. For the uh, yeah. uh, I, uh, I, what am I looking for? I, I, um, what, what perks my interest? I would say, uh, selfishly, you just want to play for a winning team a lot of times, uh, because you know that you can, you know, a, a movie underperforms at the studio level. They lose. Lose two hundred eighty million dollars. Somebody gets fired over it. You know what I mean? Uh, so it's not that different with actors. You can have a couple clunkers, and suddenly you're instead of driving the car, you're sticking your thumb out. You know what I mean? So, yeah. So I think like I, I try to look for a winning team. It's kind of like the NBA. These guys are like, who can I pair with to make sure we get to the championship next season? It's that kind of uh, cheap, selfish strategy. Um, so when I get a call from my reps and they tell me, hey, Doug Lyman might want you for this movie or, hey, Catherine Bigelow has a project you might be right for. I, I'm going to lean into that because, of course, um, having said that, I'm really lately, especially getting sober, I'm careful with my spirit. So there are some things that 
I'll read and go, wow, I love that actor. Wow, they're shooting there. I've never been there. And then I go, what is this, what is this going to do to my psyche or my spirit? And, uh, and what is the message it's sending out to the world? And if it's a horror film, I'm going to need some redemption. I want to see the bad guy get clobbered. I don't want to put another message out into the world that says evil triumphs were screwed. I'm not interested in that. Right. Um, so I think it's some combination of creative excellence and what is the effect this might have. And uh, with something like Blackbird, I really do think to bring it back full circle, I think we, I think we show that bad guy lost. He's behind bars. The pain will never go away, but uh, he can't hurt anybody anymore. And, uh, and we're, we're shouting out the victims on, um, on a, a sort of victory march that at times looks like a dirge looks like a funeral procession. Well, gentlemen, big congrats again on your SAG Award nominations for these two amazing roles, two spectacular shows. Thank you both so much for taking the time for a fantastic conversation for SAG After members. I mean, this is uh, the, you're preaching to the choir, so to speak. So thank you both so much for your time, for joining us. And thank you everyone for watching.